Hey, welcome everyone to Berkeley Labs Life Science Series. My name is Elisa Batale, Content Instruction Coordinator for K-12 STEM Education Outreach Programs here at Berkeley Lab. And I'm so excited to have you all join us today. So we are back with our Life Science Series, continuing to connect community, culture, and STEM. And if you joined us last time, we scratched just the surface of the science behind the vinyl and turntable in hip hop culture. Today, we are excited to continue our hip hop STEM journey into boom bap's origins, evolution, and connection to coding. In case you haven't joined us for previous live science sessions, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, or Berkeley Lab for short, is one of the 17 Department of Energy National Labs located in Berkeley, California. Berkeley Lab is home to 14 Nobel Prizes and credited with the discovery of 16 elements on the periodic table. And we also like to say we have the best view from a lab, as you can see from our picture here. All right, so now I would like to introduce our special guest hosts for today's program. Max Wall is a member of the Berkeley Lab Director's Apprenticeship Program 2020 cohort, and Angie is a member of the 2021 cohort. Uh, Maxwell is a college freshman studying uh, who will be majoring in computer science and Angie is a high school senior here in the Bay Area. So welcome Maxwell and Angie, it's great to have you join us today. And to get started, can you tell us what's your favorite experience been working with Berkeley Lab? My bad, I meant to unmute. <laughs> so yeah, my favorite experience was definitely um, listening to the uh, Friday Career Talks where um, I learned a lot about uh, many scientists' passions and uh, how they got where they are, um, what their careers entail. And it was like a really broadening experience. Um, it showed me many fields I didn't even know existed. Um, and yeah, it definitely helped me uh, explore more of the STEM field. Yeah, then I think for me, my favorite part of working at the lab was kind of having the opportunity to work with all these other uh, student scientists across the Bay Area and getting the chance to meet a lot of scientists at the lab who uh, worked in a lot of these fields that intersected. So seeing how these different fields of science don't just have to stay in their own lane and how sometimes they can cross over and be used uh, in tandem to solve uh, these different issues in these all new ways, just like really inspiring and pretty cool to see. That is awesome. Thank you both Angie and Maxwell for sharing your highlights. So since both of you are our guest hosts for today, I'm going to leave and let you get our audience ready for the program today. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lisa, for passing us the mic. So um, uh, we look forward to learning a lot today along with the audience. Maxwell, can you help us with a few reminders for the session? Yeah, sure, Angie. So first, we've turned on our live transcription. You'll see a button at the bottom of your screen that allows for closed captioning during this session. Second, if you haven't downloaded it already, there's an accompanying info sheet that you can find on the Berkeley Live K-12 STEM Education uh, and Outreach website, and we're posting that website in the chat box now. Yeah, uh, we encourage you to use the chat box not only to click on links, but also to ask questions. We will be checking for your questions and comments throughout the session. We hope you can stay with us for the entire session, but in case you have to go, the session is being recorded. Uh, you'll be able to find the recording on the website next week, along with previous live science sessions that cover numerous topics, such as soil science, star formation, and particle physics. All right, yeah, so let's go ahead and get everyone ready to use the chat box. Uh, we want to first start off by uh, getting to our audience and hearing where you guys are from. So if you guys could just drop down where you guys are at right now, where you're listening from in the chat box, uh, I can go ahead and read those out and you can see some interesting answers. Oakland, oh, Richmond, okay, okay. I'm actually from Richmond, that's nice. Hercules. <laughs> Hercules, Atlanta, okay, cool, cool. All right. And so now, oh, SF, actually, yeah, I go to school there. <laughs> All right, and our second question is, what materials and or instruments have you used to make a beat before? Let us know in the chat box. Pens. Tables. Yeah. Hands, nice. 
guitar, drums, ukulele, sticks, piano, very cool, pots and spoons in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, my brother loves banging on uh, bowls. He actually <laughs> broke one the other day. <laughs> okay. Um, that was awesome. Thank you for using the chat box. And throughout today's session, we encourage everyone to keep using it. Ask us questions, leave us comments. We would love to hear from you. Now I'd like to introduce everyone to Dr. Faith Dukes, who is the director of K-12 program here at Berkeley Lab, and will be helping us learn about the evolution of beat making. Hi, Faith. Hi, Maxwell. Hi, Angie. Nice to see you all today. Yeah, we're excited to know more about beat making and how that relates to coding. But I think first we need to step back and get to the origins of beat making. Can you take us back to the past and share with us how it all started? Sure, Angie, sure, Maxwell. So I'm excited to get to talk to you all about the origins of boom bap, which is what we call this experience we have today in live science. We're gonna start with beat making back in West Africa, usually played with the bare hands. You can see the djembe, which is a rope tuned and skin covered goblet shaped drum, which gives us the bap of boom bap that we'll be talking about today. The kinkini, dundun, and sangban are mid-sized drums, played with drumsticks that gives us our boom. So we have a boom and a bat that we'll be hearing ryth rhythmically today. And we'll get to hear these drums and instruments played as a start to our lesson to go from physical all the way to digital over time and through this hour. So first I'd like you to hear the boom bap of the djembe, the dundun, kinkin, kin, and sangon that are played in this video. In another video, we were introduced to the djembe, which is a West African drum. The djembe is almost always played together with the dunduns. Now, the djembe is played with your hands. The dunduns are played with sticks. And there are three different types of dunduns. The highest pitched one, the smallest, is called the kenkeni. The second one is called the sangba. This pitched one is called the dunumba or just the dunun. All right, thank you, Faith, for sharing about the African origin of boom bap. From Africa, drums spread through various cultures around the world over time. Now we'll hear from two Berkeley Lab employees about drums in the Middle East. Hi, my name is Bobby Xavier. I work for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, the IT division. And uh, one of my hobbies is to play a drum instrument from my country, which is Iran. This instrument is called DAF. As you can see, the DAF can come in many different sizes. Uh, the smaller the size, the higher is the pitch, and the bigger is the size, the deeper is the, uh, the, the pitch of the sound. in the energy technologies area and I work on energy efficiency policies and programs. I do research. The first one is called the Rick and it's basically a tambourine but you play it with your fingers like this. You can also play it like this and some of the rhythms 
that they play these drums on are for belly dancers. I'll demonstrate is called the Dumbek. It has different names in different countries, but um, it's also a really loud drum that in Middle Eastern music they use for belly dancers. Thank you so much, Bobby and Liz, for creating these videos. You can see their full videos through links on the handout for this live sign session. Beyond Africa and the Middle East, drums can be found all over the world, like you see in the map shown here. Have any of you heard of these drums? Use the chat box to let us know and definitely tell us if you play any of these drums. Congo. Taiko. Tabla and Taiko. The djembe. Yeah, I used to play the djembe as a kid also. Looks like we have some beat makers joining us today. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, let's move on to getting to, into the cultural history of beat making. Back to you, Faith. Thanks to you, um, Angie and Maxwell, for, and thanks for all of you joining us today. Um, we are going to continue with the beat making of today and still keeping with physical manifestations of boom bap that comes from the school halls, lunchrooms, and hallways. Pin tapping is another manifestation of boom bap. You can use pins, pencils, knuckles, and other physical tools to create a beat um, in ways that musicians have also created boom bap. I'm not going to embarrass you with my own skills in making boom bap with my kitchen table right now, but I want you to check out the wonderful example of musical creativity and an understanding of sound and rhythm in this next clip. So that's a great clip and example of someone using the classroom desk to make boom bap. And I've been talking about this term throughout this introduction, but the term actually came from um, the song It's Yours, which is a classic hip hop song from 1984 by MC and Def Jam collaborator, Terrence Ronnie Keaton, or known as Tila Rock. Tila Rock um, was a part of the very first single from Def Jam called It's Yours, where he used the words boom and bap to describe the beat of the kick drum and the snare to mimic the sound of the rhythm. You can listen closely right now to hear Tila Rock vocalizing boom bap in this clip. Hopefully we've given some of you an opportunity to dance in your seats and in your homes or offices this afternoon. But we, have, we can't finish this introduction without one of the greatest examples of boom bap and the human beatbox, also known as Doug E. Fresh, a legendary hip hop artist. We wanna hear from going from drums to your kitchen table, to using your mouth in order to make a beat. So let's listen.
As you've seen, there are many ways that you can create boom bap or beep using physical ways such as drums in our hands, mouths, and pencils. Now it's time to transition to technology and music production using instruments that are more digital than analog. Some of the earliest hip hop songs and beats were made using the Roland TR-08 for the drum and the drum machines that you see in front of you. The MPC 2000 and Akai Mini and many others are used to make some of the music that you've heard in the past and the music that you hear today. The Akai Mini is used by hip hop artist and educator Jahi that you'll see in the video we have next, um, showing how he created his own beats in his own laboratory. Check it out, Jahi here, live and direct on my Akai Mini. Uh, I want to show you how Boom Bap can transform a particular track, and I'm going to use this as my kick, and this as my snare. So this is my boom, and this is my bap, okay? Uh, if you want to know what I'm working on, I'm just on GarageBand, the electric drum kit under Trap Door. Similar to scientists in STEM, what they do is they create take samples and they may manipulate them or test them in order to find the right combination of things. So I took a sample of some acoustic jazz that I'm gonna play for you and then I'm gonna transform it and add some boom bap to it. Check out this sample. Okay, so that's a pretty long sample. Acoustic jazz does not have any uh, boom bap in it. And here's what it sounds like when you add the boom bap. Check this out. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Jahi, for sending in this demo and all the other resources to understand Boom Bap. We've gone around the world, tapped on our desks, and gone into the music laboratory to learn how to make beats. Next up, we're moving to coding. So take a second to stand up, turn around, and stretch during our one minute intermission. And if you haven't already, this is a great time to make a profile on EarSketch, the music and programming platform that we will be using in our next segment. Now, can anyone, now, oh, sorry. Can someone, anyone, play me a beat? Do you want to create amazing music? Producing your very own original song? In any genre. Hip hop? Yep. Dubstep? Definitely. Pop? Uh-huh. Trap? Yes, again. EDM? Absolutely. Even gospel? You know it, any music genre you can think of. And you can even use music samples from famous artists like Sierra. And Common. Just go to earsketch.gatech.edu. Then hit the link to find all the tools you need. Sounds. Beats. And code. Wait, code? No one said anything about code? <laughs> Don't let that freak you out. Nowadays, tons of music is made using simple code. Using languages like Python and JavaScript. You don't even need any coding experience or even music experience. This is a song I made. And mine. And mine. Any student can do this. So what are you waiting for? Just click Get Started on the EarSketch site. 
to start making music. An ear sketch could make you, 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 the next big music producer. Welcome back everyone. I hope you all had time to stretch and have a profile ready to go in your sketch. All right, well, I'm ready to code. But first I would like to introduce Sabrina Grossman who is the program director of science education at Georgia Tech Seismic, which stands for the Center for Education Integrating Science, Mathematics, Computing. Hey Sabrina, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Maxwell. I'm excited to share your sketch. Sabrina, can you share with us a bit more on what your sketch is? It looked awesome in that video we saw during the break. Sure, Angie. EarSketch is a code to music platform that allows you to remix audio samples in Python and JavaScript. We have over 4,000 audio clips in our sound library to remix from top recording artists such as Pharrell, Jay-Z, Sierra, Common, Alicia Keys, and Khalid. You can run your code in a multi-track digital audio workstation, which is similar to what you saw Jahi coding in in GarageBand, but you might also be familiar with another one like Pro Tools or Soundtrack. You can also collaborate virtually on EarSketch, share it with friends on SoundCloud, or download your remix. EarSketch is free and online, no downloads necessary. This is so cool, I can't wait to get started. But I think first we're gonna to have to have some Bricky Lab scientists help us make sure we have all the basic code down before we start creating our beats. I would like to introduce everyone to Sharon Greenblum, who is a computational biologist at the Joint Genome Institute. Hey Sharon, we're so glad you joined us today. Hi guys, great to be here. Thanks for the intro. Uh, we also have with us uh, Lavanya Ramakrishnan, a senior scientist in the scientific data division at Berkeley Lab. Hi Lavanya, thank you for joining us. Thanks Angie, excited to be here today. All right, so Sharon Lavanya, can you help us with knowing some of the basic coding terms before we get started with coding beats? And for those of you who already know how to code, feel free to help out younger siblings or older adults who are new to this. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Over to you, Lavanya and Sharon. All right, great. So today we're gonna give you just a super short intro to coding, um, enough to get you started so that you can play around, make things happen and make some music. Um, so first off, we can rewind what is coding or programming as some people call it. Um, you can basically think of learning how to code like learning any other language. Um, it just is the language that computers speak. It's the way you use words to tell the computers what you want it to do. Um, so probably some of you already know a few languages, right? English, Spanish, French, JavaScript. Um, how many languages do you guys know? Put it in the chat box. Any multilinguists out there? Four, that's impressive. Okay, so you can add this to your language toolbox um, as you learn a bit of coding to be able to work in your sketch. Um, and if you know a bunch of languages, you probably know that it takes a while to learn completely, but even a few basic words can get you started and can go a long way. So that's what we're gonna help you with today. And we're gonna use real world examples to explain some concepts of coding and you might find that you're already using some of these concepts in your everyday life. All right, so I guess we're gonna add one more language to people's uh, coding skills today. Um, so we will also show some example code that we will use later in Year Sketch. As Sabrina was telling us, we will use Year Sketch to put together these songs and melodies um, and sort of bring these concepts together. So what concepts are we learning today, Sharon? Well, today we have three concepts that we're gonna introduce. One is a variable, the second is a function, and the third is a loop. So can you guys put in the chat box, how many of these three terms have you heard of so far? Let's see what we got. All three, we have some coding experts. None, all, okay, so a pretty wide range. Well, we are gonna get everybody on the same page in just two minutes flat. Okay. 
So the first step is a variable. Now, a variable is a symbol that computers use to refer to something else. For example, sometimes in real life, you want to talk about something, but it's really long and complicated to explain. So you can use just a short symbol to refer to it instead. Can you think of any symbols that you use in the English language? A really short catchphrase to mean something that is actually pretty long and complicated to, to explain? Any ideas? You can put it in the chat box if you do. Math equations are, are one, one way to think of things. Do you use math when you talk, maybe? But math equations are also symbols. There are, there are symbols in math equations too, stand-ins for something long and complicated. Um, and one cool thing about a variable is that you can use that same symbol to mean different things at different times. So, okay, bear with me here. Let's say that you're a pirate and you've buried your treasure in a secret spot. Now, it would be super long and complicated to tell all your pirate friends exactly where it is. It's buried under the fifth palm tree from the water at 37 degrees north, 48 west, where the sun hits the sand. Um, so instead, how about you just hand them a map with an X? The X on the map doesn't actually mean that there's an X drawn on the ground where it says on the map. Uh, instead, it's a symbol. It's a variable that's a shorthand for telling your pirate friends where the treasure is buried. So as I said, the meaning of the variable can change, though, without changing the actual symbol. For example, let's say one of your pirate friends let slip to his evil uncle where that treasure is buried. What do you do? You need to move the treasure, right? So you move the treasure, make a new map. Now the variable x means something completely different the treasure might be buried underneath the fifth palm tree, um, but the X stays the same. And that's the power of a variable. You can assign it a value and that value can change. So one other way to think about variables are they're like they're virtual boxes that store values that you can reuse later, right? So a variable has a name and a value. So you often see things like X equal to three or something like that. Um, on the right side of the screen here, you can see some sample code from your sketch. What are we doing here? We can see we are assigning valuables to three variables, the base, the kick, and the snare. Each variable can only hold only one value at one time. Variables are assigned a value using the single equal sign as shown here in the slide. Here we can see that base is set to a hip hop base Remember these values because we will bring them to use later when we get some coding in here. Sharon, shall we move on to the next function? We sure will. So next up, we have functions. So you can think of functions as basically the machines of the computer world. They do things for you. So if variables are kind of like nouns that person places things that you want to assign a label to, Functions are almost like verbs. They're where all the action happens. Um, you can give a function some instructions or inputs, we call them arguments. And then the function will do something complicated and make something happen, maybe give you an answer. The important thing is you don't actually have to have any idea how the function does what it does. You just have to know how to tell it what you want. So think about a vending machine it's kind of like a real life function. You enter a combination of numbers and letters to tell it which drink you want. Those are the arguments, the inputs, and it will work its magic inside, whir and stir a little bit, and then spit back in orangina. So just like a vending machine, a function does something different depending on the arguments you give it, but in the end, you get what you want. So functions make our life easier because we can start, write it once and use it multiple times, right? So your sketch already includes a special set of functions for making music in Python. We use three different functions here. First is init, which just tells the program to initialize. So it's kind of like saying, hey computer, here's some code coming at you that you should read and do something with. In the next one, we're telling the computer to set the tempo of the song. 
Here the computer already knows how to set tempo within that set tempo function. And we're just passing it an argument to tell it what to set to, which in this case is 88. Finally, we're fun calling a function called fit media. The fit media function knows how to take a sound clip and play it. First, we pass the variable base we set to hip hop previously. And then the second argument, we tell it where in the track to add that clip to and what measure to start and end this particular sound clip. That's your variable arguments three and argument four. So that's one and nine, as you see in the example here. I know this is a little confusing, but Sabrina will be going over this in more detail later. Sharon, what do we have next? All right, last but not least, we have the loop. So a loop is actually one of the easiest concepts. You've probably heard the word loop before. Um, and if you've ever made a playlist in iTunes or Spotify and then just set it on repeat, you're basically a loop master. Um, so just like it sounds, a loop takes a list of things and then just repeats them again and again till you tell it to stop. Now, the tricky part of a loop in coding is actually how you tell the computer how many times you want to do something. So in this example, we have on the left here of add shampoo, lather, rinse, and you can see the code at the bottom. The way you write the, in the code, how you want it to know how many times you're doing this is to use the word for followed by a set of numbers, which you can generate with a function. Remember functions from two minutes ago called range. Um, and what range does is that it expands for all of the numbers between one and five. In this case, those are your inputs or arguments. Um, so what that first line really means in English is for every number between one and five, so one, two, three, four, five, do all of the things that are in the list. So what would this particular loop do? It would wash your hair five times. Um, now, this is a little outside the norm because hopefully this isn't the routine for many of you California kids. It's wearing a drought. Don't do that. Lavanya, can you show us how this is used in EarSketch? All right, all right, time to get out of the shower there um, and get some coding here. Um, so in the previous example, what we saw was how to make music using a pre-made clip. Your sketch also has a function to create custom music on the beat level called make beat. And here we can put it in a loop and ask it to repeat it. What we're doing here is use, we see that the make beat is using, takes the kick value that was a variable we assigned earlier. And then we're asking it to play on track one and then we're asking it to start at the measure, whatever the value of the measure is at that particular instance of the loop. So what happens here is the first time you go through the loop, the measure is equal to one, the next time it's two and so on and so forth. I know this is again confusing, but now we have the building blocks and Sabrina will show us how to code all of these together to make some really cool music. Angie and Maxwell, I'm gonna hand it over back to you. Thank you, Lavanya and Sharon. I think we're all set to code now. All right, uh, so. Yeah, so we can't wait to get started, Sabrina. Let's get coding in EarSketch. Awesome, I'm gonna share my screen now so everyone can follow along in EarSketch. Thank you so much, Lavanya and Sharon, for sharing the code behind the song. Let's get started on our EarSketch platform. I shared a sample script with you in the chat. So if you can check the chat box and click on that link. A script is a code that the computer understands as a set of directions. Just as a script for a play or TV show tells an actor what to say or where to go, a script is a set of instructions telling the computer what to do. So hopefully by now you've clicked on this link. If you want, you can import it if you want to code along with me, or you can just click it and view and follow along as I code. And maybe later you'll import it to actually edit the code. 
Also, hopefully you've created an account. If not, you can go to the upper right hand corner in EarSketch and register a new account, create a username and password. So let's check out the EarSketch platform. The script that you imported should be in the code editor, which is in the center of your screen. This is where you'll type and edit your code. Just above the code editor is the digital audio workstation or DAW. This is where you will visually see your audio clips or code. The digital audio workstation is the main tool in producing music on a computer. It is a specialized computer software for recording, editing, and playing digital audio files. As you may have seen, um, Jahi was working in GarageBand, which is a sample of a DAW, and it allows you to edit, combine clips on the timeline, and also visualize the different clips of your music. Right now, my DAW is empty, but in later in the session, you will see how you can visualize your music by looking in the digital audio workstation. So on the left-hand side, you will see the content manager. This is where we have our sound browser, where you can see all of the 4,000 sounds, our sound collection and our featured artists. We also will have our script browser. And if you've created an account, every script that you create is automatically saved in the script browser. This is awesome because how many times have you maybe lost some work if you forgot to save it? Your sketch will auto save it for you. And last but not least, we have our API, um, which is our application programming interface. And this allows us to see the ear sketch functions that are specific to ear sketch and gives us a full tour of all of the functions that you can use. So this is a good guide or glossary for ear sketch. On our right hand side, I'm going to close the content manager. I'm going to toggle it off. I'm going to toggle on the curriculum. This is used as a series of tutorials for you to teach yourself your sketch on your own. If you like to teach yourself stuff on YouTube, there's videos, there's sample code, and you can search for any topic on how to use your sketch. Okay, I'm also going to toggle this shut just so we have more room as we code. And if you want to do the same, it sometimes is helpful um, to have as enough room your code. Okay. So now we've looked around the EarSketch platform, we are ready to actually check out the code that you have imported. So I'm going to start at the top. In your script, there are four sections. The first few lines of the code are comments. These are not executed by the computer. You may notice they have a hashtag or pound sign and are in green. These comments describe your script and make it easier for programmers to understand what your code is about. Sharon, what are some other ways we might use comments in coding? Well, comments are really important to programmers. Um, we use them all the time. They're only used by humans for other humans to read just to make the code easier to understand and to help organize it or leave yourself notes for when you come back to your same code in a year and don't remember what you were doing. You can also use comments to describe what different sections of your code are doing um, so that you can break it up into pieces. Awesome, thank you, Sharon. So as you can see, um, our top section is comments, and we've given ourselves our script name and author. You can type and change your comments here. Um, so if you want to write your name, um, you can simply type, and none of this will be read by the computer. So just below our comments is our setup section. The from your sketch import, um, allows us to add the EarSketch API to the project. So this basically tells um, our computer that we are going to use special EarSketch functions. Right below the EarSketch import are two functions that Lavanya explained earlier, init and set tempo. Init says to initialize, and that means that's where the computer will start reading the code and set tempo allows you to choose your tempo or speed of your project. And that is measured in beats per minute 
and could be anywhere from 45 to 220. In this case, I chose a tempo of 95. Most hip hop songs have a tempo between 85 and 95 and boom bap beats are often in the 90s. Okay, let's look at our next section. Um, and that is our music. I started it off with a comment that says sound bank, and this helps organize our code. So it lets the next programmer or the reader know that this is where I'm putting my sounds. In this case, our sound bank contains our variables. Lavanya reviewed that the variables can store values. Here we have our bass, our kick, and our snare. And these are all storing sound values. These nicknames for our sounds allow us to reuse these sounds throughout our code without typing out their long name. Next, we have the function fit media. Fit media is a special function in EarSketch that tells the computer to insert a sound. It also has four arguments or details that will tell the computer what sound to insert, where to insert it, and how long to play it. Again, when we are giving computers code, we need to give it details. So we can't just say play a sound, we have to tell the computer where and when to play the sound and what sound to play. And so in this fit media, we're telling the computer to play the bass sound, which is actually our hip hop bass sub 001 on track one from measure one through measure nine. We have a second bit media that is also telling the computer to play a sound on track two from measure five through measure nine. So we finally made it to our boom bat beat. So I'm going to scroll down and we start our beat with a for loop that Sharon explained. This loop tells the computer to repeat the code below for a certain time period. In this case, we are looping the beat over and over again for eight measures. We use this beat to be able to repeat our boom bat through our 20 second song without having to write code over and over again. As I like to say, make the computer do the work not the coder. Underneath the code are two makebeat functions. Right here, makebeat allows us to compose music note by note or in 16th beats. So previously when we were coding, we were writing our fit media went for each measure um, and each measure has four beats. So with makebeat, we actually take those four beats and divide them again in fourths to create 16th beats. Um, and this is perfect for creating our drum beats or our boom bap um, because we don't want to have it for too long. We wanna have short beats, just like the tap of a pencil. This approach is called step sequencing in music production. Just like our fit media, our make beat also has four arguments. We have the sound, which because it's boom bap, we have the kick and the snare. We have the track number, so we have to tell the computer where to play this. So each sound is on a different track. So we have our track number, which is three and four. Then we have measure, and then we have our string, our beat string. In Python, a string is a series of characters with single or double quotation marks around it. Um, so you might even have, you might have words, you might have an address in this string. Um, strings are often used in programming to represent non-numerical data. Um, and in this case, our strings represent beats and they're in symbols. So the zero here represents a beat, the dash is silence, and there's also a plus, which is not here today. So if you were to beat this out with your hand or your pen, or your pen it would kind of be, and so you could even practice doing the boom bap with your pen or pencil and then coding the beat string in ear sketch. Hi, Sabrina. I actually had a question. Can ear sketch be used on iPad? No, unfortunately, ear sketch cannot be used on iPads or mobile devices. It's only a computer at this point. 
Okay, sounds good. Thanks so much, Maxwell. Yes, we're hoping that it could be accessible in iPad soon, just not quite yet. Um, so as you can see um, in my Makebeat, I've created um, my boom with the kick, my bap with the snare. Um, before we play this, Vladia, I think I see a variable in the code. Can you share more with the audience? Yeah, the variable is measure, and it represents the measure that the beat will play. In this case, that variable holds the values between one and nine. Awesome. So as you can see, our make beat, we're going to just keep repeating our beat from measures one through measure nine for about 20 seconds. So the last part of our script is finish, and that lets the computer know that it is complete. OK. Finally ready to play my boom bap. So I'm going to click the green run and you could do the same on your computers at home. And it might take a second or two to load. And as you can see, we spoke about the DAW earlier, the digital audio workstation. You get a visual of your music. So you see my two fit media, and then you're able to see my make beats in my 16th notes repeated below. Okay, um, I'm gonna make sure my sound is shared so everybody can hear this. And I'm gonna click the green play button. Okay, Maxwell and Angie, what did you guys think? I think it sounded awesome. Great. So what what can I add or change? Um, I think it sounds pretty good, but maybe you can make it faster. I can definitely do that. So Angie was asking if I could make it faster or speed up the tempo. So I can come up to the top of my code in my setup and go to my set tempo here. And let's try it at 110. Okay, our tempo can go between 40 and 220, but um, marching pace is about 120. So we'll do it a little bit slower than that. And then every time I make a change in ear sketch, I click run. And in my console on the bottom, it will say that my script ran successfully. So I know that it worked and I'm going to click play. increase in tempo. Thanks, Angie. Um, feel free to make some more changes in your code. You can add more fit medias um, and you can look for more sounds in your sound bank um, by searching by artist or genre or instruments. Um, you could even, if you want to change up your boom bap, it's as easy as adding um, extra beats into the string. So play around with the string. Maybe you'll find a better boom bap beat than I did. Um, you could even add maybe another kick or snare. You can search um, in your sound library for kick. So if you want to see what a different kick might sound like, if you didn't like the one that I chose, um, you click play and see if you like different kicks. So um, you can make beats just as easy in code as you can in the recording studio. And one also cool thing about ear sketch is if you don't want to code in text, you can simply click over to blocks mode and toggle on blocks. And this might remind you of Scratch or other coding programs, uh, but you can slide in um, fit medias from the side and continue to code in block. So thank you so much um, for letting me share EarSketch with you. And if you're interested in learning more about EarSketch, um, we have a new competition called Your Voice is Power sponsored by Amazon Future Engineer. And we'll have that link in the chat. And back to you, Maxwell and Angie.
Yeah, actually, can you share a little uh, a little bit about how your sketch was developed? Yes, of course. Um, the origins of your sketch is that it was first developed at Georgia Tech in 2011 under Professor Jason Freeman in the School of Music and Professor Brian McGurko in the School of Literature, Media and Communication. It was a cross collaboration between a computing and a music faculty and it was developed to inspire students to learn how to code through music. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, and also thank you so much, Lavanya, Sharon and Sabrina for joining us today. It was an amazing uh, opportunity to learn the origins and cultural history of Boombop. It was pretty neat to hear all and, and see and hear all the different ways to create beats too. Uh, yeah, I agree, Andrew. And I'm really excited to keep coding some beats on Ear Sketch. I also want to thank our audience for sticking with us. We hope you enjoyed our program. We look forward to seeing you all at the next Life Science on January 21st, all about climate change and wildfires. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Hope to, hope to see you guys soon.